The question so many are asking in the aftermath of this tragedy, could it have been prevented? We are learning more details about who Elliot Rogers emailed his violent manifesto to in the minutes before the murderous rampage began. ABC's Clayton Sandell has the story. Could Elliot Roger have been stopped if only someone had all the pieces warning he had finally snapped? Well, this is my last video. It all has to come to this. On Friday at 9.18 p.m., Santa Barbara police say Roger emailed his 137-page manifesto to his family and other mental health professionals. But police tell ABC News one counselor who had worked with Roger for years didn't open that email until around 10 p.m. He didn't read through it in its entirety, but skimmed through it and found some uh, very alarming portions. Just 11 minutes later, the counselor called police, but by then it was 40 minutes after the shooting started. When Roger's parents learned of the manifesto, a family friend says they raced from L.A. to Isla Vista, told by police they were too late. A special education teacher from an organization that worked with Roger tells ABC News his family was, quote, desperate for help. Recently, Roger had three run-ins with police, the first last summer. He claimed he'd been attacked, but in his manifesto admits he tried to push female partygoers off a 10-foot ledge after he says they insulted him. In January, he accused a roommate of stealing candles. And just a few weeks ago, sheriff's deputies came to his door because his parents were worried about his increasingly disturbing videos. Police say they did not see any reason to hold him. It's not against the law to say inappropriate things. It's against the law to act on them. This morning, we also know that Roger's attack was not spontaneous. He wrote that he began planning his so-called day of retribution back in 2012 when he bought his first handgun. George. Okay, Clayton, thanks. Let's get more on this from our chief legal affairs anchor, Dan Abrams. So a lot of planning went into this. We know that the therapist who saw the manifesto eventually called the police, but it was too late. What kind of legal obligation would a therapist been under earlier? It seems that there may have been more than one therapist here as well. Uh, a therapist in the state of California, this does vary state to state, is required to try to protect the victims if A, they're reasonably identifiable. And in the manifesto, he did identify the roommates and others. So you've got that. So a specific um, threat, you have to do something. It ha right, it has to be specific and the, the victims have to be identifiable. But in California, you have to do it within 24 hours. It had been immediately, the law was changed to make it within 24 hours. But let's be very careful. I don't think any of that would have necessarily made a difference here. This was a very long manifesto. We don't know, for example, what the first therapist who saw it uh, actually saw in the manifesto. Was she able to get through the whole thing? Did she see the part about the victims, et cetera? So uh, it, there are a lot of questions here, here still to be asked, and it seems that he intentionally sent it at a point where no one could really do anything. And despite this history, for a long time, still able to buy a gun. Well, and that's connected to the psychology, right? Because if he had been put uh, in a psychiatric facility, if he had been adjudicated by a court to be mentally unfit, uh, that would have changed his ability to buy a gun. But because here, when the police came by, for example, they didn't determine that he could be involuntarily held in a psychiatric facility, uh, that prevented them from taking any action. It also allowed him to purchase a gun legally. Okay, Dan Abrams, thanks very much.